go ahead and get started. I think we're okay. recording. Are we, Cam? We're going. So um, we're going to do a quick introduction, and uh, we'll just get started. So thanks again for joining me, man. Yeah. Hi, guys. This is Doug, and you're listening to What's the Hazard? It is April 7th, Friday, and I'm here in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, I think we have made it to spring. The sun was up this morning. My buddy Andrew Huberman tells me I'm supposed to go out in the morning and stand in the sunshine, let a little, little, little bit of sunshine get into my retina. So I took my coffee and my dog out onto the front porch this morning and stood out in the sunshine, the eastern sky, and uh, it was it's a fantastic way to start the day. So um, I'm excited about today's guest. We, we have been talking about doing this for quite a long time. My guest is Ed Stuber. He is with SGS Galson. Uh, coming to us from New York, I believe. Yes, Are you sir. actually in New York? Not so sunny Syracuse. Not so sunny? Okay. <laughs> well, I, it's coming your way. Yeah. I hope. Um, you are the industrial hygiene portfolio lead. Uh, so you oversee much of the industrial hygiene services, I believe, for the laboratory. And uh, as most of you know, I'm an industrial hygienist by training. I started off in 1987 as an entry-level industrial hygienist with the Department of Defense. That's where I started, and I've been doing industrial hygiene work ever since. And the lab side of this is kind of the third state of uh, industrial hygiene. You've got you've got the field guys like me that are out there humping pumps and dosimeters and things, uh, dealing with the insanity of the workplace. And then you've got the research folks, uh, the NIOSH people, the ACGIH people, consensus organizations. And then behind the scenes, you kind of have the lab side, the ana analytical chemists, the, uh, the technicians, the people that are working on methodology, the people that are helping guys like me develop sampling strategies and things like that, answering questions. And so, Ed, um, it's a pleasure to have you on, man. And uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this job. Let's do you know, let's get going. Let's talk a little bit about you and your background. I know you're a CIH, among other things. So you yeah. st so tell me, did you start off as an IH and then move into the lab world, or were you a lab guy that became an IH? Yeah, you know, so I, I may not look it, but I've got 41 years of experience with uh, industrial hygiene. And uh, I, I actually started, well, I graduated in 77, and OSHA uh, started in 1970. So, uh, and um, laboratories became accredited by AIHA in 1976. So one year after the labs were accredited, I graduated. And I graduated industrial hygiene was not well known. There weren't any master's programs. There weren't any uh, degrees that you could get. So I had a biochemistry degree. I uh, didn't really know what the other, uh, like, Thought I wanted to be a dentist originally. That didn't work out. So yeah, um, uh, I got a job in an ideal laboratory that was doing environmental and, and IH work. And um, I had, seemed like I had a knack for it. I picked up things pretty quickly. And um, after four or five years in that lab in Pennsylvania, I moved up to uh, Syracuse and started working with Galson um, back in 1982. Wow. And... Um, uh, Working that at that time, that lab was doing IH and environmental work, and I'd worked there through probably 1996 or so when it was sold. I I, I was a laboratory um, rat, and then became um, a hygienist. So um, most people don't do that. Once you get into the laboratory, it's pretty much that's what you're going to be doing in that. Kind of transitioned out of that one. So you were were you out actually in the field then doing like sampling? Yeah, you know, yeah. So originally it was all all lab work, and then uh, I did end up uh, doing project management for this so I gen I uh, had in the field for two or three years. So uh, I do have some experience on, like we said, humping pumps and good seminar mm -hmm. and riding with forts and uh, the worst part of doing all that is. Just trying to get billable hours. Best mm -hmm. you may, may know, um, I've been on business and, and so yeah. working in a laboratory and having samples come to you and you process them and move on. It's pretty much cookbook type stuff that you're doing. 
Um, you're always running the same set meal, metals, VOCs, et cetera. Whereas in the field at the high dentist, you know, you found a lot more variety on understood sometimes. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, just over the last couple of years, I've moved into a different role where now I'm for forward to leave for Investor High June. And that puts me in the responsibility of being the subject matter expert for the whole company, STS, and uh, being the, the go to gal for any technical issues that might arise, both internally with our old people and externally with uh, with our client, with yourself. You know, you deal with, like to say, you deal with our client service now. Uh, Jim Trader's excellent. He's also a CIA at each. Mm-hmm. Uh, he came from the vault where also search all very well good that give you the information that you might need. So um, it's um, it's been great because now I'm taking my my experiences, my knowledge, and moving it forward to read up. Our, our clients like yourself and internally with our old people because Dawson, on the history of Dawson, we were a hundred person firm. We we have a hundred people, one laboratory located here in, in Syracuse, New York, doing about uh, 25, 27 million dollars a year, just plugging along, doing great, being innovative, et cetera. Then we fought by STS. We went from a hundred people company to like 90,000 people, 140 different countries. 1600 different facilities and labs but what scs didn't have is a very good air laboratory presence he knew wool blade warning to the united states so it made us the center of excellence for industrial hygiene and they uh said okay you guys know what you're doing keep doing it and everything will be fine and that's the way it's been since 19 uh 20, there are 2014 day virus. So it's been nine years and it's been great uh, working with them. There, you know, we, we are the center of excellence for investor yes. marketing. But then, oh, well, that's incredible. I, I, I have to admit, I, you know, I, I left OSHA at the end of 2013 and started my own business in 2014 and needed a laboratory. You know, when I worked for OSHA, it was the Salt Lake Technical Center and everything that we did yeah. went out there, oh, Sandy, yeah. Utah. I took a couple of industrial uh, IH chemistry classes out there at the lab and enjoyed those very much. But I'm a field guy. I'm, I'm mostly actually just a bullshitter. And so I just apply some industrial hygiene technical skills to um, what I do, you know, communication wise and try to help people understand what we're doing and what these numbers mean and how to interpret them. But I found Galson Labs and I think at the time it was still Galson or you were in yeah. the transitional period. And the service was excellent. And and to this day, the, I, I have to tell you, the service is excellent. The customer service representatives are always helpful, uh, always very cheerful. Um, I actually have made friends with a number of your, your coworkers. I look forward to speaking with them and they're incredibly helpful. And so I have actually uh, recommended to a number of my clients that they set up contracts and service agreements with you guys as well because you know there are times when you might need a third party to do sampling uh there might be regulatory issues or there might be legal issues that really require a third party to be doing this assessment why but there are certainly times where internally a company just needs to generate some data they just want to know something about a process and they can certainly do the sampling themselves so a number of my clients have contracted with you and I think they would agree that you know the service is always excellent and so to that I, I, I just want to thank you because it makes oh. my life so much easier when I know I have somebody from a technical standpoint I can contact and get some clarification or well, on just the fact that I know that when my my pumps are going to arrive they're going to arrive even in in spite of the fact that you know during the COVID years uh there were some disruptions yeah. in the delivery stuff but it's always been great, man. So whatever you guys are doing, I commend you because the the service is impeccable. Yeah, well, that's thanks for the very kind words. So we feel the same way, um, you know, because in reality, uh, you know, the IPH accredited laboratories, which which is what consultants use and what they know, 
OSHA looks at and other things. So, you know, everyone's got the same accreditation. Uh, everyone is using the same methodologies. Everyone is using um, the same instruments, et cetera. So, you know, what's, what makes you as a, as a client want to use us versus these others? What sets us apart? And what you don't want to have setting you apart is, is just price. Um, you know, you don't want to be looked at as a laboratory. We don't want to be looked at as a commodity. We right. don't want to be looked at like a hand owl thing else. It's, you know, <laughs> get, the cheap, get the cheapest one. It doesn't matter because, you know, all you're going to do is draw your hands. Well, you all have the same accreditation. You all have the same methods. You all use the same uh, instruments. Well, why should we use you if you're not the lowest? Off step there. And it's, it's our people. No Just doubt. like you said. It's it's how we treat you. It's the transparency. It's the communication. It's the responsiveness that we have. It's the support that we give you. It's the, uh, the truthfulness. It's it's all those things, and that's all ingrained by management and top down to everyone. And it shows with their client service people. It shows with whoever you up with. Uh, you're gonna get that same feeling that. These people know what they're talking about. They care about my accomplishments, my issues. But if there's a mistake or if there's an issue, we're going to own up to it. They're going to let me know. They're going to fix it. Well, it's going to be okay. So that's how we set us apart. Then, and this was all done by um, my um, Galson and Galson set this. Le- Galson Laboratories was started in 1970, the same year as OSHA. It was started by two brothers, engineers. Uh, and, and they wanted to, and what, one was married to the M-Street manager, uh, White Ron Vaughn. He set up a lab in 1976 um, so his wife could direct it, but using for chemistry degree, and, and um, they got AIH accredited, one of the first 10 labs in the nation that got the accreditation, and they've been accredited ever since. And the owner... Uh, when the lab was fought in 1976 by uh, the current half directors who were by the lab director, but, uh, he instilled, this is what we got to do. Here's our principles, here's our mission. It's customer service folks, man. It's been a way of life here. Awesome. So I'm glad to see that you realize that. And it's fantastic. That's what we're doing. That's, that's incredible. And that's an interesting story because it's not easy as you as you described, you know, the original Galson as a hundred person, yeah, that small family of people taking care of their clients and then to be absorbed and to, to grow by that magnitude. Overnight, yeah. Overnight. But to maintain that level of customer service without really a, any glitch that I was aware of, and I didn't see any. Maybe on the behind the scenes you were not, like not really, no. It's the I do give up I do give STS management kudos because you can hear some horror stories where companies get, you know, swallowed up or merged or whatnot, and they lose their identity, they lose their culture, et cetera. And they looked at us and said, you guys are the leader in the industry. We do not want to mess you up. Okay. Continue, well, that's continue good. along. Uh, we've got your management in place. You've got your... Uh, culture in place, you know, we just, somebody else will be signing your paychecks, but other than that, you guys are doing a great job and we're right. here to support you. So it's been good. It's been well, good. good for them. I'm, I'm glad that yeah. they realized that and they kept their hands off for the yeah, most they part. Yeah, they could have messed us up. They, they could have messed you up badly. <laughs> well, just in general terms, talk a little bit about the types of services that SGS Galson provides. I know specifically what I use, but I know a number of listeners probably would have other needs. So can you just, in a nutshell, or quickly just go through Yeah, some- yeah, yeah. well, thanks for giving us giving me this opportunity. Um, you know, SCS Gawson, what, when, what, when I first started, we were an environmental and industrial hygiene app. We did about 50-50 in, in RevMol, where we were doing solar, we be waters, and fixing waters, as rates, and air samples and that. And, and uh, in 1996, when we... Gawson, he sold themselves off, and we got the lab director that was in the lab, that was part of the lab. And he goes, you know what? This environmental, it's uh, it's high risk. It's uh, it's we got a lot of have a storage. We got have coolers. We got an awkward. It, it's it's 
and it's regional, and it's, it's pain in the pot. Um, let's look at phasing that out and just do an air board and see how that works. And we did over a couple of years, we phased out all of our environmental work. Now we are the largest air only laboratory in the world. That's all we do. Every, all of our trading, all of our people, all of our instruments, all of our analyses, it's all focused on air work. And that would be OSHA compliance, work for health and safety, indoor air quality, ambient air, fence high monitoring, all that. We're, we're totally focused on staying up to date with OSHA regs, staying up to date with the methodology, training, giving presentations, doing uh, public service uh, announcements, uh, logs, uh, et cetera, PDCs that we get involved with. So it's all about in air and industrial hygiene. And what we started from 1996 as we moved forward, we wanted to be heavy. You don't want to dig all of us in this industry. So we, when I started, we had, and everything was 10 business days for three round time. That was standard. And that was the practice. We went from 10 down to five business days as standard turnaround time, guarantee or you know, pay. No questions asked. If we can't get to you as often there in, in a five day stamp turnaround time, we will make your life boring by not having you to, to pay for that. So five days are free. Then we went into a free offload program. With, if you're not familiar with that out there, we have about 14, 1,500 pump. That's right, not in the 150, 1,500 <laughs> that we own and maintain. We have a whole department that maintains these, that uh, makes sure they're in good operating order with placing old ones that need to be replaced. But we loan these to you uh, so that you can supplement your own equipment if you if you don't have enough pumps or if you don't have pumps at all, we can you know, let you use these. Um, no charge. You pay for some shipping. Uh, they calibrate the pumps for you. Send it to the calibrator if you need it. And then you collect your samples and back to us. The only date for the analysis. So the free pump loan. Then we went to free sampling badges. We now we give you the, the passive monitors at no cost, just like we give you cassettes with boo. Mm -hmm. so another innovation there. Then we developed kits, sampling kits for in your quality with Lal and Lee. So now you can get, uh, in addition to the lab work, if we get rental equipment from us. So now we, we provide you with notice of seminars, uh, compliance based containers, CIDs, et cetera. Uh, you pay shipping one way, we pay the shipping back for you. And now we're giving you equipment, the rec green instruments, we're doing lab work, giving you knee and up. Uh, five days are free. And uh, the latest innovation that we have now is we're really working on what is the next level going to be with industrial hygiene and samples and laboratories. But we're looking at sensors. Sensors seem to be. Uh, the darling of the industrial IT world now where uh, with COVID hitting two years ago and now people are re-entering the buildings that, and the workforce again. Uh, workers want to know, you now is it safe to be in these buildings on an indoor? Uh, employers want to know is it safe for them uh, to have workers stuck in there on um, public on uh, injury building. So, you know, how do you do that? We can't just keep collecting the year samples and, and sending them in. You need something that is going to tell somebody in real time what the quality is in the year and whether it's uh, a safe environment. That, so real-time sensors are the big right now. Uh, we we developed uh, our own sensors, not developed sensors, but the uh, instruments that use the sensors that could be either rented for short-term duration or firmly installed in, it's with our smart sense units that we have, uh, custom built or, you know, we can pop and play in sensors that are out there. So we're looking at, you know, what, what can we do to keep working in the air field with the laboratory that we primarily are? We know laboratory analysis is never going to go away, but we want to supplement, so we supplement breathal equipment. Now we're supplementing with sensors and how they can provide that to our, uh, our people. So I and love that. That's what we're doing. That's really interesting because, um, you know, I've been doing this since 87 and I've seen quite an evolution of the, uh, 
you know, just the um, sampling technology in and of itself, but yeah. the analysis as well. Um, I can remember when I first started, we were using um, impingers yeah. with fluid in them hanging from somebody's, you know, lapel yeah, or something. Yeah, you had nitric acid or hydrochloric through sodium hydroxide or whatever. Exactly. Hanging from their chest. Yeah, they would have to stand upright the whole time. If they leaned over, all that yeah. shit all over the place. Or yeah. I can remember having to sample okay. like with Tedlar bags. We would have to fill bags up with carbon, with gas of some sort, and then what? send the the bag into the lab. It has come so far. Um, it, it's so. been really interesting. I mean, just one example, and one of the things, everything that you mentioned, I take advantage of. So again, thank you for that. The free loaner program, uh, the equipment rental. Um, you know, those types of services have been really useful as a, I'm just a sole proprietor. I'm just a one man shop. So when I left OSHA, I didn't have any money, uh, in part because of my time with OSHA, I didn't have any money, I, I, you know, but, um, I couldn't purchase a lot of equipment when I first started doing my own work. And so the free loaner program, the rental program was incredibly useful, Yeah. but I can remember just as an example, respirable dust you know when i started we were using those old nylon cyclones the big one cumbersome they just kind of yeah. hung there and then there was an aluminum cyclone yep. and now we're using the little particle impactors the ppi yeah. yep. which are let, let me just say from the standpoint of the ih out in the field this is a great benefit but to the employees that are wearing this shit for eight yeah. hours or more this, this is tremendous and the, you know the, the advent or at least the acceptance of the badges that you mentioned, the passive monitors, so much better than changing charcoal tubes every 15 minutes or whatever, go. man. I mean, it's it, it has come a long way. And I, I'm sure you have seen quite a progression over your over I've your seen years. the same because of the length of time that I've been from like, you know, like I said, when I first started, you know, collecting samples with impingers, uh, I remember at the laboratory, from the laboratory standpoint, the methodology has is, is changed a lot. The instrumentation has really changed a lot. Also, because back when I started, say, running metals, you had uh, a flame, a flame AA, where you run one metal at a time. So you run all your LEDs, and then you switch everything over, and then you run all your... You know, it's, you know, it's like, that's how you did it, and you you, you did anything up. Uh, Never had any, didn't have procurers. It was printing vapor that was giving you the results, and then you have to tap you in and it. Now, and then it went to uh, ICPs where you can take one sample, run it through the ICP one time, and get 20 or 30 different metals all at once. Mm -hmm. It's done, done deal. GCs, we, I remember in GCs when we were running all tools on a GC, we'd let it. And the chromatograph would come out, and you get this peak, and it comes over. And then we take that peak, and we'd have to cut it out and weigh it <laughs> and to get the results. And then, and now everything's so automated. We put it on an auto sampler. If you come into our lab and you look in our instrument room, you will never. All you'll see is instruments. You'll see batches and batches of instruments with auto samplers mm -hmm. on top of them. You, I would love to come out sometime, man. That yeah, would be really you really should. It's fascinating. But you see, you say, well, where is everybody? Well, all the technicians are in a uh, bullpen with cubicles. They're, they're, they're monitoring and they're running the instruments remotely. Um, and they can do it from home on the weekends, after hours, et cetera. The only time they're in the instrument room is when they're loading samples. Mm -hmm. And if I say, if we see somebody in the instrument loop and they're not loading samples, there's a problem. <laughs> right. That's uh, really, not, that's really fantastic. It's come a long way. It's come a long and way. one thing that it's helped is just the, the, just the, the volume or the quantity of sample that you have to take in order to do that. As you said, if you were doing one metal at a yeah. time, or, you know, if you were doing analysis like we're that, it really sample. required a lot more sample. Yeah. Yeah. So it's cut back on that too, which has made my life easier as well. So yeah, it's, it's come a long way, both in the field and how I can set going from, uh, and here's to the tubes to acid monitors worn from you know, nylon cyclones, aluminum cyclones to PPIs. Um, so it's, it's, it's been fantastic. Yeah. It, it certainly made my life easier, man. So I appreciate that because that's really what is ultimately most important to me is uh, if you're the guy that's up at four in the morning, 
hooking people up with pumps and you're you know chasing guys around all day long you know and as you've experienced that that's been my life for the last 35 years is basically um watching employees um either with intent or inadvertently screwing up my shit you know so dropping pumps or you know back in the day when noise dosimeters had a cord that ran to the microphone yeah I can remember I had a metal fabrication facility. I'd hook these guys up, and then I'd go back to check on them periodically, and the cords would be cut because they're working around sharp metal, climbing under stuff. Wind screens would be off, you know. They'd pull the cord loose, or they'd pull the wind screens off. It was just, you know, my whole day was spent just babysitting equipment, and things are so much easier now. You got the wireless BT. You got that wire. Oh, yeah, man. It is. right on, yeah. Exactly. It's, it's really tremendous. And so you talked about sensors and, you know, direct reading real time measurements. Um, and I think, as you said, I really I, I would foresee that as being the future of what we do for a number of reasons, just like in um, smart, smart factories, there will be sensors that are monitoring c- c- continuously. Yeah. Um, just to measure those things. I work with a company called Make You Safe out of Des Moines. That is, uh, they they make um, wearable devices for individuals that will be doing some level of monitoring throughout the day. They will be monitoring for noise levels. And so rather than just doing traditional industrial hygiene where you take a sample and that is just representative of that day and time, you know, on the date that I did the sampling under those conditions, right. that's what we got. You know, the sensors will allow for much more data, much better interpretation. I mean, that's very exciting to me. So, very, very much so. Yes. It looks good. You know, and, and I think the future, you know, as we're, as we're moving along, uh, it's going to be more and more. Right, like right now, sensors are being placed in, in buildings and rows um, and doing continuous monitoring and all this up cloud and in the, I'm the view on the house and we can see all this data, but I think at some point, you know, we're going to be seeing these sensors being uh, worn just like you wear a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or anything. You know, you mm-hmm. the Fitbits and Apple Watches now, you can get your heart rate, you can check for any bit of uh, you know, what pressure more. You get these be bi- biomedical uh, readings, but eventually I think, you know, we'll have sensors on here that will be looking at potential for exposures for welding tombs, particulars in general, we have VOCs, et cetera. And all that data is going to be right there on your phone, real time. And uh, it's just a matter of, you know, with years, probably that we'll be in that, in that realm. But yeah. and say- That's exciting stuff. Now, I don't know if I'll be around to see that or yeah. if you will be what 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 are your plans, man? You got some more years left in you, or what's the? Yeah, you know, I do. I, so I've got a daughter that in grad school. She's just turned twenty four. She's got two more years, so she'll be twenty six. So I think I'll hang on for another two years till she graduates and she becomes a non dependent and <laughs> has a job hopefully and um, it's her own insurance et cetera. So that we had a couple of years. Um, yeah. She's actually going to be a She's a PhD. She's going to have a PhD in audiology. So, oh no, kidding. Similar to well, she'll be working with with people with hearing and and that. Mm-hmm. So she's yeah. We talk. We talk this. You know, decibels every week to the wall. And, Absolutely. And that, uh, but I, I I do hope to do some. Um, you know, so I'll retire maybe two years, and then uh, I do like to travel. You now that my wife we take some pretty nice vacations, but. One of the things I do like to do is some, you uh, know, venture. In the past, I've actually uh, summoned Mount Kilimanjaro in, in Tanzania, and I that's, did that with my son, who was 18 at the time. And that's about 20,000 feet, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's uh, 18 five or something like that. The highest, and, uh, the highest peak in Africa. Or? It's the highest peak in Africa. Uh, second, well, the third highest peak outside the Himalayas. Mm-hmm. No covered. Um, we start was it, was in, it? It's just right at the, just south of the equator. It's unbelievable. You start in rainforest, and six, seven days later, you're standing on glaciers. 
at the you're, yeah you're the on a dormant glacier that's amazing dorm, dormant volcano so that was a quite an adventure uh, i'd run with the bulls um <laughs> over in uh, Papua in spain i went there and the first we didn't know what we were doing they run they run like four days and mm-hmm. every night the bulls go into the arena and then they and do the in there but so the first day we go there we'll see we'll get around the bulls to get out there we got in the wrong place and the in the police security came in and they pepper sprayed everyone to get us out of there <laughs> so we had a bad first day experience there but after that we realized well we don't go there we go over here yeah yeah and then we ran with the bulls and that was great we did that and ever extremely that gets your heart pumped Oh, I'll bet. You will never, ever outrun a bull. So. Oh, I'll bet. I, I used to use, when I was doing training, you know, I used to use a photograph that it was taken uh, many years before with the running of the bulls where some guy was getting gored right through his leg. And you no, can see I, the, I'll be seeing a picture like that. You, I'm you sure you've it. seen it. I, hopefully it wasn't you at the no, time. But, no, we, we, we survived with uh, no, no that's injuries. That's awesome. You was good at time. So, can you mention you've got a trip planned? You're going out to Washington. I do. I do this fall, but in the end of August, I've looked gone back out to Washington to find uh, Mount Rainier. It's it's only fourteen five. I say only. I mean that's still pretty we good height, but it's the most glaciated uh, mountain in uh, uh, outside of Alaska in no in kidding. the U.S. And so, it's a lot of uh, crampon roping. You see those those aluminum ladders that go over crevasses. Uh, be doing that. You know that's a uh, violation of OSHA regulations. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Every time I see those guys walking those aluminum <laughs> ladders, I'm thinking there's a yeah. citation. So I've been I've been doing some uh, since uh, I live in Syracuse, um, and we do get a lot of snow. And I like this I like the snow ski, so we do a lot of snow skiing in that. But I've been actually training with crampons and boys uh, town at and going up the ski slopes here, we have the cramp on to this up uh, on the on from now on till I get out to uh, out to out to Washington. There won't be any snow. I won't be able to do any training with that. So I'm trying to do it in now, and then uh, hopefully everything will go according to plan. And, yeah, uh, it'll be good. Well, you could. We used to drag. You know, so uh, when I was working out, we used to drag sleds around. So we would. Yeah. Put weight on a sled, hook up some kind of a harness, drag that up and down the hills, man. That's I can put on some crampons and do that. I can yeah, see that. There you go. It's pretty <laughs> flat, exciting. pretty flat in Nebraska, isn't it? It it well, we have a hill. I mean, do you have a hill? Nothing. We have a hill that we climb once in a while. I mean, everybody's there, so it gets a little crowded. But yeah, but we do have. Um, there's actually a little bit of terrain, but it is pretty flat. It is if if you want to get into the mountains, you have to go west about eight hours, and oh, yeah. you can get to the mountains. I've got a son that lives out in Colorado, and he is basically living your life. You know, that's forty years ago. Yeah, he's I would, I would doing love those to be, things. I would love to do that. We have the Adirondack sphere, which is about two, three hours more to fear, where they have about an out of snow four thousand five thousand foot buttes, mm-hmm. and then that crazy. It, it's nice. I, I don't know what the highest peak in Nebraska is. I'm guessing the highest point, other than maybe just like Chimney Rock or something, the highest point in Nebraska might be 1,500 feet, maybe. I don't know, something like that. Man, that's, that's more than I read yet. Yes, <laughs> right. I read Ed, man, it has been a pleasure. I, I've really enjoyed this. I Like I said before, I really appreciate everything that you and the lab do for us. Those of us that are still out here humping pumps and things. We're dead. Uh, it is a tremendous service. And I, I've had great experiences with all your folks. So thank you for that. And um, I'm looking forward. Maybe we can do this again after your yeah. watching. I'd love to hear about the climb and yeah, how that goes. I would, yeah, I would I'd love to come back again and, and you know. Even talk you know, about some of the some of the stories. I didn't want to put you on the spot, but. There have, I have had some incredible screw-ups over the years with either the sampling that I was doing or with the employees that were being sampled. It'd be kind of fun just to talk about some of those mis- missteps over the years, too, as well, at some point. Yeah, I, I, I get some good stories, I bet, over the years. <laughs> just no. good, man. Yeah. Um, we're going to put, um, for those of you listening, we're going to put the uh, website information, SGS Galson, 
in the in the uh, episode notes of this particular episode. So you should reach out to Galson, um, SGS, yep. I, I should say, perhaps. And um, almost every com- company that I work with, most of my clients are industrial manufacturing facilities. We do work with some construction folks. Um, one of the things that we did not talk about that I think we'll just mention briefly on our way out is that the website has a number of really useful video clips about how to do sampling, how to use particular equipment. You know, if you are unfamiliar with some of the equipment, and I really appreciate that because there have been times where due to um, supply issues, I have gotten uh, equipment that I wasn't familiar with. And normally I would just go into a state of panic if I didn't know how to run a piece of equipment, but I can go onto the website I can find a link to that little video clip, learn the equipment quickly and have no problem using it. So that that's also been incredibly useful. It was very handy with that. Yeah, man. So it's all good. So Ed, thank you very much. Please, you know, again, pass my gratitude on to all the folks that are working for you in the, in the department and uh, have a great weekend. And I hope we get up again soon. Happy Easter to everyone. Happy Easter to you too, buddy. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Have a great weekend and a great Easter, as Ed said, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Bye-bye. Bye-bye.